All right. After bartering for passage and evading the guards, you boarded the vessel named the Conway. As the Conway sails forth from the harbor, each of you casts a lingering gaze back towards the silhouette of Waterdeep, its spires and structures growing fainter with distance. A profound realization washes over you, much like the inexorable waves of the sea. You're all now adrift amidst the looming storm of destiny's design. What do you want to do? All right, Joe, I want to find a quiet place on the deck of the ship and cast augury as a ritual. Isn't that a cleric spell? It depends. Originally, yes. But if Joe's allowing the changes made with unearthed arcana, then a wizard using augury is fair game. Yeah, I'm fine with this. We've already included some UA stuff, and with Tronald being a divination wizard, it makes sense. Well, that's fair enough, then. Okay. So it's saying here that you need marked sticks, bones, or similar tokens worth at least 25 GP. I'm just going to use 25 gold coins for it. Um, that's not how I interpret it, dude. How I see it is you need whatever token you use to have some deep meaning or deep connection to you. If that's the case, then gold coins should be perfect for Tronald, right? She's right, you know. I can't think of one thing in terms of items that are more important to our good old Tronald than gold. That's an excellent point. You know what? Go for it, dude. Thematically, it makes sense, so why not? Excellent. Tronald, as the Conway bobs gently over the undulating waves, you take a deep breath, grounding yourself on the ship's wooden deck. In a clear space, you meticulously lay out a series of gold coins, each one shimmering under the sun. Positioning them in a precise formation, they glint and gleam, awaiting your magic's touch. Closing your eyes, you begin a chant, each word interweaving with the next, summoning guidance about the impending journey. The distant calls of gulls and the soft thrum of the ship's movement fade into the background, leaving you in an absolute stillness. It's not long before a comforting warmth spreads through your being, reminiscent of the joy of discovering a hidden treasure. But this feeling is abruptly disrupted by a chilling sensation, a cold so biting it feels as if you've plunged into icy waters. As the spell's energy dissipates, you regain your surroundings. The coins no longer just material wealth, but now a conduit of foreknowledge. They've conveyed to you a clear message about the voyage ahead. Both fortune and peril await. Great insight. Both fortune and peril await. I could have guessed as much. But at least now we know. I mean, sure, we know for as long as our actions do not deviate in the slightest from how they were set out when I cast the spell. Our plans have as much stability to them as a bartender with a tremor. Well, we've got a two-day journey ahead of us, so what's the plan? Just get some rest? Or is there anything we could be doing? Aside from them two freaky-looking people, I don't have the foggiest of what else could be gained throughout this passage. Well, why don't you go and talk to one of them? I mean, we've got nothing else to do whilst we're on this vessel. So at least you can make sure that they're not going to be a problem. Whatever. Joe, I walk up to the beefy dude and say, you've got to be one of the thickest men I've ever seen in my life. What brings you out to sea? Oh my God. Tronald, as you approach the gargantuan figure, the subtle rise and fall of his chest beneath layers of muscle and fabric gives away his dormant state. Yet without a second thought, you voice your observation. No sooner had the words left your mouth than the very atmosphere around you seemed to shift, growing heavier, colder. With an unnerving swiftness, the man's eyes shoot open, two piercing orbs of the darkest obsidian that seem to consume the light around them. They fixate on you with such intensity that it feels as if they're burrowing into the very core of your being. Every contour of his face, every rugged scar and deep-set wrinkle is accentuated by the sheer force of his gaze, rendering him an embodiment of raw, unbridled menace. The world around you becomes muted, distant, as if those eyes have drawn you into a void where only you, Tronald, and the weight of his silent judgment exist. So he's not saying anything to me, but instead just staring at me. How polite. God damn it, Tronald. I meant go talk to him at any point within the two days of traveling. Not this exact moment when he was fucking sleeping. Well, how the hell was I supposed to know he was sleeping? Dude, Joe literally told us. Either way, there's no need to be so disrespectful. It wasn't like I was rude or anything. No, you just woke him up and called him thick. Oh, to hell with this, I say. Buddy, I know I'm pretty to look at, but I feel like we will make no progress at all with this conversation if you just continue to stare at me. What's the matter with you anyway? Are you a mute? Did the gods convert the mass of your tongue, multiply it by a thousand and stuff your muscles with it? God damn it, answer me. What part of your brain came to the conclusion that this was the best course of action, Tronald? Please enlighten me we would have been better off sending in the fucking RAR at this rate. Huh? And no, before you try any bullshit, that was not me summoning you. Tronald, as you remain ensnared by the man's harrowing gaze, you can't help but discern a bizarre feature about him. His lips appear to be conjoined, bound by a peculiar seal, intricate patterns woven into the flesh as if they've been meticulously stitched shut. A horrid realization washes over you. He's been deliberately muted. 
rendered voiceless. The air around you grows frigid, sending a shiver down your spine as a delicate yet icy grip descends upon your shoulder, turning your met by the piercing, luminescent eyes of another, their chilling silver sheen set starkly against skin as smooth and dark as the night sky without a star in sight. His sharp features, high cheekbones, and slightly elongated ears with various silver piercings all paint an ethereal, almost otherworldly picture. His voice, dripping with both malevolence and faux concern, carries a subtle mocking lilt. You won't extract much conversation from this one. You know, men of his stature make impeccable couriers. A challenge to overcome in battle, near impossible to capture for information. Yet, on the off chance someone were to achieve both feats, this arcane seal ensures his silence until it's willingly undone. His thin lips curl into a cold smirk, his gaze never wavering from yours as if he's savoring a private joke at your expense. All right. Joe, I've sent you a text over on what I want to do. A text? What's with all the secrecy? Well, it makes it a little less metagamey and a little more immersive, in my opinion, anyway. All right, dude, I've sent you one back. Jeez, that was fast. Well, I have all of this stuff planned out thoroughly, so it's just a case of copying and pasting for the most part. This is interesting. Not what I expected, but definitely interesting. All right, Joe, I say to the man, I'm sorry for bothering you two gentlemen. I'll leave you be. Before I walk away, I turn back towards the chunky man and say, Maybe we can catch up when you're in a more talkative mood. Why the fuck are you antagonizing him, man? You clever little shit, Tronald. Yep, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. Welcome to the club. Speak for yourself. I know exactly what's happening. Right, yeah. Sure you do, Ra. Go on then. Please enlighten us. Why would I do that? Clearly, Tronald wants to keep it a secret for now. And if you don't have the mental capacity to figure it out yourself, why should I do the heavy lifting for you? Whatever, man. Okay. I make my way back over to the group, gather them up, and get them over to an area where we will be out of earshot from everyone else. So are you going to tell us what that was all about? Certainly, allow me to unravel the mystery. What I've done was akin to poking a slumbering beast, and I did so with a calculated intent. I approached the colossal man to observe the reaction of his associate, which provided me with the first piece of the puzzle. To delve deeper, I cast detect thoughts on the silent giant. His inability to speak made his mind the perfect place to glean insights with the spell. As I waded through the layers of his consciousness, my suspicions were confirmed. They are indeed collaborators. But the intrigue didn't end there. Desiring to uncover the purpose of their union, especially given our recent tribulations, I continued to probe. It turned out that our fears were misplaced. Their mission bore no connection to us. What I unearthed instead was a clandestine operation. The immense one bears encrypted information of an illicit nature, destined for a shadowy recipient in Fane. His dark companion serves as a magical safeguard, an arcane sentinel ensuring the message's security. Intriguingly, he seems unaware of the content, knowing only the importance of its safe delivery. Okay, so what is the message about? To glean the specifics of the message, I implemented an additional layer to my strategy. As I was parting from him, I slyly injected a veiled taunt, seemingly innocuous, but directly linked to his task. My intention? To cause a ripple in his consciousness, guiding his thoughts toward the message and allowing me to catch a glimpse. And catch a glimpse I did. Their game is one of the oldest and darkest in the books. Trafficking. They're rendezvousing with a contact who has accumulated a considerable number of unfortunate victims. Their ultimate destination, it seems, is the remote fringes of Zephyria. Wow, Tronald. Consider me impressed. You managed to learn all that while staying under the radar. You're something else, dude. Yes, I know. I'm quite impressive. However, there is one mistake in your assessment. Under the radar, I did not stay. You see, he absolutely knows about me probing his mind, but there was no avoiding that. In fact, his thoughts as I was leaving were almost entirely about slaughtering me in my sleep. And if he saw us group up, then there's a high chance you're included in his intended slaughter. Oh, well, thanks for that, Tronald. You're the best. I don't appreciate your sarcasm. And I don't appreciate you trying to get me killed everywhere we fucking go. Does it really matter if they want to kill us? I've got a simple solution for that. We kill them first. Whilst I'm all for ridding the world of scum like that, in my opinion at least, there's not enough evidence here to be the judge, jury, and executioner. And I point blank refuse to be a part of another venture of killing people on Tronald's say-so. If they're to die, it's going to have to be after they've initiated with us, proving their malicious intent. Huh. You see, this is where it's funny. We can't actually do anything to them. If we want to save the people they've captured, that is. It's more than likely that if we dispose of these two, and nobody shows up at the meet, we will never know who is keeping them captive or where they are hiding. So, 
Yeah, how do we get out of this one? Well, in the worst case scenario, we could always keep the big one alive until I've probed his mind for more information. That only leaves us stuck behind the second issue that I mentioned. Nobody will turn up to the meet, so we will never find out where they are being kept. I could always just shapeshift into one of them. Yeah, but there's two of them, Celestia. I'm pretty sure you have the ability to use disguise self, right? So if the worst happens and they decide to attack us, then we can always just mimic them to meet the individual at the dedicated spot. You know what? That's actually a solid plan. Rar, I know you probably don't have any interest in this side venture, but I wouldn't feel comfortable sitting around and not attempting to stop something like this. I have little care for grown-ass adults that are weak enough to let themselves be captured. But children is where I draw an absolute line. These bastards think they can get away with destroying their lives. I'll fucking kill them both. I'm a little surprised that that's your take on it, but a pleasant surprise at that. It's nice to have you on board with this. So it's all well and good that everyone's keen, including myself, to rescue these people, but we're forgetting one tinsy little detail. We're meant to be on Kobe's tail. We've already delayed for far too long. If we take another detour, we may very well be too late to find him before he convenes with someone from the Obitus, and then we potentially lose all our leads. Thereafter, Kobe could very well disappear from our reach entirely. But we're just going off assumptions with the Obitus. We're assuming that they're after you. We're assuming that Kobe is heading to meet them. And we're assuming that whatever it is Kobe is doing will speed up whatever it is they're planning. Granted, some of these assumptions have more evidence backing them than others. But what we know about these traffickers is factual. It's happening. And it's something that we have the ability to stop. Well, let's base it off facts then. The letter we found in Rick's manor indicated that the Obitus had found the Sword of Kos, and they intend to unify it with its master. Is there any actual solid evidence that would lead us to believe that whatever it is Kobe is doing would speed up this process? If not, then I'm happy to take this detour. Well, you being Lord Tan has really put a spanner in the works. You said that your arcane focus was invaluable and has been your prime focus for as long as you can remember, right? A focus owned by Tronald the Wizard would make me believe that there is no hurry at all to prevent it from getting into the wrong hands. But the arcane focus directly linked to Lord Tan, potentially the most powerful arcane wielder of his time. That gives me some serious cause of concern with how they plan to use it. This is a horrible decision. Celestia, do you believe that there is a high enough chance of the arcane focus being used maliciously? to abandon a group of innocent people to slavery and torment. Do I believe the focus will be used with malicious intent? Yes, I do. Why else would Kobe target that specifically? However, do I believe that the degree in which they intend to use it to be of a magnitude to warrant us abandoning these people? I'm not sure. I have no idea of what the Obitus are capable of, never mind how a relic from Lord Tan will influence this ability. But there's one thing I know for certain. When dealing with people's lives, I go with hard facts and evidence, and there is just far too much that's in the realm of the unknown for me to chase Kobe over saving these people. Okay then, so it's decided. We detour away from the plan to track down Kobe and save the people who are being held against their will. Um, Ra, are you okay there, buddy? No, Tronald, I'm not. I'm absolutely fucking fuming. I'd love nothing more than to go over there right now and break their fucking spines in half. All right then. So it's clear that this has touched a nerve. But listen, Rar, Celestia isn't comfortable acting until they act first. As a group, we've already put her in an uncomfortable position once. So if this is about her maintaining a true path with her deity, we need to let things play out without us rushing to take action. Oh, to fuck with her deity. Why do I give a toss about what some fool in the sky who begs for people's worship wants? This is the real world where real shit happens. And I'm not about to lose one of you guys waiting for them to attack first so that Celestia can feel like she's doing the right fucking thing. Just because you don't have anything greater in your existence doesn't mean you can start talking shit about other people's life choices. All right, I think you both need to calm the fuck down. You've got to remember, we're on a very public vessel here. If we initiate, then eyes are going to be looking our way, thinking that we are the problem. I am calm. It's him who's got some serious emotional instability, like fuck. I know it comes from a good place, but what the hell happened to you in your childhood to make you so fucking angry all the time? Let's not go there, Celestia. What? Just leave it, okay? Joe, whereabouts are them two individuals? Make a perception check for me, Saxy. That's a 13. Saxy, with a roll of 13, your gaze sweeps over the deck, keenly searching for the towering figure who had been seated under the ship's main mast. The spot, which was once occupied by his intimidating presence, now sits empty. 
As you tread cautiously, allowing the ship's sway to guide your steps, your attention darts from shadow to shadow, looking for the elusive pair. Minutes feel like hours as the uncertainty builds. Despite your best efforts, they remain unseen, leading you to the conclusion that they've likely retreated to the ship's bowels below deck. I've got an idea, guys. Why don't we let the captain know? Or at least the first mate. I mean, whilst they're not here, it would be the perfect opportunity for us to let her know. Then, given her permission, we can question them more thoroughly, right here. Then, if needed, we engage with them. I mean, sure, we could. The only problem I see happening is that she would want to turn them over to the authorities, you know the correct channels once we land. That wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing though, right? I mean, if the proper people get told about what's going on from someone with authority, then they're more likely to take it seriously and take the correct actions to resolve it, whether that's blocking access in and out of the town or doing door-to-door -door searches. I'm more than happy to go down this route, but in the end, it'll be up to Ra. If Ra wants to deal with this personally, then I'm going to be dealing with it personally alongside him. Okay. I'm happy to go along with this, but I'd still very much like to pursue it separately to the correct channels, you know, to make sure the job gets done right. Then that's what we'll do. Saxy, how about you take the lead on this one? I've got every faith in you that you'll handle it like a boss. Okay, Joe, I make my way over to the captain, assuming I can get there without interruption. Then I want to say to her, hello, captain, there has been a development on your vessel that I think you should be made aware of. There are two individuals hiding somewhere beneath the deck that are part of a trafficking ring and dealing in the slave business. Out of pure chance, my friend, a wizard ended up reading one of their minds. That's how we know about all of this. All right, I'm gonna need you to roll a persuasion check for me, Saxy. And no offense, but the DC is gonna be pretty high, mainly because that explanation probably wasn't executed in the best way. Don't listen to him, Saxy, it was beautiful. Fuck yes, that's a natural 20. Wow, nice work, dude. All right, I take it back. It was executed perfectly. Thanks, Joe. As you unfold the dire narrative to the captain, you can trace the transformation on her face from a dubious raised brow, dismissing you as some rambling fool, to the sharp focus of a seasoned mariner who's caught the scent of danger on the wind. Without a moment's delay, she emits a piercing whistle and with a swift gesture summons her trusted first mate. Gather a handful of the idle crew and secure the men he's talking about. Tread lightly. They're not to be underestimated, she instructs with an urgency that underscores the threat. Acknowledging both of you with a curt nod, the first mate swiftly navigates the deck. He taps certain sailors on the shoulder, gathering a team as he collects sturdy ropes. Moments later, which feel elongated by the palpable tension, you see the duo in question being hauled from below. While one sailor manages to restrain the magical being, it takes half a dozen to subdue the mountainous figure. Nice work, Saxy, you son of a gun. I knew you had it in you. I'm gonna be the first to say it. Celestia, how stupid do you look now? The big guy was stopped by six fucking sailors. Hell, I'd rip through six bloody sailors before breakfast and without breaking a sweat. Right. The captain, now with a gaze of gratitude, turns to you, Saxy. Your courage in bringing this to light is commendable. Many would have chosen to ignore, deeming it none of their concern. You've earned my respect, she confesses, taking a moment to clear her throat. Then in a voice that carries across the ship, she declares, Ladies and gentlemen, our journey will take an unexpected turn. The vile men before you are traffickers. They won't be allowed the privilege of freedom. We'll be making for the shore, dealing with this menace away from innocent eyes and the faint of heart. With a resolute flare in her eyes, she whirls back, gripping the ship's wheel with ferocity. The sturdy timber creaks and groans under her force as she masterfully steers the vessel, redirecting its prow westward. The ship, as if catching her urgency, slices through the water with renewed vigor, charging towards the nearest shoreline where justice awaits. And that is where we will pick up next session. You know the drill? Stick up your thumbs, swan dive into the comments, and if you want to help this adventure get even crazier, you can support me on Patreon, where you will receive access to all episodes one week early and make me a very happy Tronald.